This is the reading of the Holy Word of God. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This is the word of God. We are continuing in this book of Acts series. We are going over the book of Acts text by text, one after one. Now we came to this text. Now in this text, we find the central components of the gospel. Today's message is about the gospel, as you can see, right? Verse 22 is about the life of Jesus. Verse 23, death of Jesus. Verse 24, resurrection of Jesus. Life, death, resurrection. I I think this text is kind of short. What we read this morning is, but I think it's very rich. I think I can preach one sermon per verse. I have three sermons, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to put them all together into this one message. Now, previously, we saw that in the previous text, Peter was quoting from the prophet Joel, explaining about what is happening on the day of the Pentecost. And at the end of that, Peter says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And remember I said, the question was, okay, who is the Lord there? who call upon the name of the Lord, who is the Lord. And Peter is building up his sermon and his message here to the point that Jesus is the Lord. So, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus in faith and repentance to be saved. That's where Peter is taking people through his message. And now he's kind of opening up his sermon here by addressing the people with something that they themselves know very well, something that they cannot deny. Would you go back and look at verse 22 with me? Verse 22, it says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. As you yourself know. You know. You yourself know. The miracles, the signs and wonders that Jesus did, it was undeniable. Actually, that is the reason why they killed Jesus. I mean, during those days, if you were there, I believe it was not even debatable, debatable whether Jesus really did signs and wonders and miracles or not. I mean, if you deny it, many people during that time will laugh at you. Are you serious? It was so plain. Jesus did so many of them so often. So Peter is pointing that out. You yourself know that. And Jesus himself appealed this to his opponent too as well. Let me take you to John chapter 10. Verse 30, 24, it says, So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you. And you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. At least the things that I do testify to you, bear witness to you about that. Verse 36, it says, Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. I told you, I am the Son of God. I told you, I am the Christ. And if it is hard for you to believe my words, take my words, okay, then at least 
believe the works that I do. And these are the clear signs to you that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. They couldn't deny those mighty works of Jesus. And one occasion, Jesus healed a blind man, a man who was born blind, right? And people were amazed that they have never seen, never heard anything like this, opening the eyes of the man who was born blind. So this man was brought to the religious leaders, and religious leaders asked him, who opened your eyes, and how did he do it? And he explained it to them. But they asked him again and again and again. They did not want to take his answer. I mean, to the point, they even doubted, questioning whether this man was really and actually blind from the beginning. So John chapter 9, we see this. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? That man answered them. I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The blind man, the man answered, Why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. And if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. I mean, this was clear to this blind man. Now, this blind man can see not only physically, he can perceive the truth. He can perceive this and understand that if God was not with him, he wouldn't be able to do this. But the religious leaders couldn't see it, couldn't perceive it. Isn't it the irony that this blind man can see but religious leaders didn't perceive. Actually, they didn't want to believe. They didn't want to believe. Church, my friends, let me tell you this. Do you know what was the tipping point for the Jews to decide to kill Jesus? What was the tipping point? Like, you know what? That's it. We got to kill him. Let's plan to kill him. What was it? John chapter 12 tells us that they decided to kill Jesus because Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. That was it. Oh, they did not doubt that Jesus actually did it or not. It was not like because they thought, oh, Jesus is faking miracles. Oh, man, this guy, Jesus, is very dangerous because he's doing false signs and wonders, fake miracles. He's a very dangerous guy. We got to kill him. That was not the case. They decided to kill him because they believed and knew that Jesus actually really raised that person back to life. So they started to see Jesus as a real threat to their position and power. This guy is dangerous. He can really do these kind of things. And all these people are following him. We got to put him to death. Done with him. It was clear to them that Jesus was doing all these signs and wonders. But because they wanted to hold on to something else, they did not want Jesus. This matters to me more. I care about this. I want to have this. I don't want Jesus because this is more important to me. I remember watching a video, a person interviewing a young atheist, in a college campus, and the interviewer asked her, this young woman. And the young woman basically explained why she does not believe in the existence of God and in the existence of Jesus. And the interviewer asked, if, let's just say if, you can see Jesus and hear him, and if you can see his miracles and all that, do you think that you will believe in Jesus? 
the young lady say, mm, I think so. Yeah, I'm a very unbiased person, evidence-based, logical person. So he asked, then, if so, would you follow Jesus, abandoning, forsaking the way of your life, the pattern of your life, and you follow him, all the bad things you stop in obeying and trusting Jesus? And with a little bit of hesitation, she replied, no, I don't think so. I don't want to. Sinners naturally do not want him. They just want to live their lives in whatever way they want to. They keep demanding more evidences, more signs, more miracles as their excuse to cover up their hard condition of, I do not want him. So they like to say, well, you know what, I cannot be sure. I, I cannot be sure. I need more signs. I need more evidences. I need more miracles. Oh, I need to see something because they love to cover it. So Jesus says, wicked and adulterous generation demands signs. Atheist people love to think, unlike the religious people, unlike religion, they are very unbiased. They are very logical, scientific thinkers. No, I'll tell you this. Wrong starting point. Atheism is also a belief system. It is also a belief system. They chose to believe. They like to believe that. Because they wanted to. It is rooted in their heart. John chapter 12, verse 37. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. Verse 43. For because they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They love something else more. This matters to me more. Pastor John Piper, you probably heard of him before. He said this. The gospel does not offer to the sinner what sinner wants naturally. Now you think with me. What does a sinner want naturally? Good feeling? I mean, that's why a lot of churches are focusing to gather a lot of people like, provide good feeling, good feeling. Right? What else? Blessings? Healings? Riches? Promotion? Success? Happiness? Fame? Popularity? And on. These are all what unregenerated person wants naturally. You don't need to be born again person. You don't need to be a Christian to desire this. Then gospel does not promise you this to a sinner what sinner wants naturally. You know what gospel promised to you? You know what gospel offers to you? What sinner does not want naturally. Gospel offers forgiveness, holiness, righteousness, godliness, humility, patience, meekness, the kingdom of God. And on top of all, Jesus Christ. The world does not want Jesus. They're hostile to Jesus. Sinners does not naturally one Jesus. If you, my brothers and sisters, desire this Jesus and all those things that gospel offers to you in Christ Jesus, oh, I want godliness, I want holiness, all, all those things, I want forgiveness. It is because God caused you to be born again and given you a new heart, new desire, new regenerated heart through the Holy Spirit. So now you got godly desire, new taste, but I want that. I want that in my life now. And that is why Jesus said, you must be born again. Do you want the kingdom of God? You must be born again. So who killed the Jesus? Peter said, even though all these things were crystal clear to you guys, and you yourself knows the mighty works that Jesus did, that God was with him. But in verse 23, Peter said, you crucified and killed Jesus. 
by the hands of the lawless man. You did it. Now pause. Stay with me. If Jesus was what he really claimed to be, to be the Son of God, the Messiah, the God's anointed king, how could God's anointed king get killed like that? And especially by the hands of the uncircumcised Gentiles. For us, Christ crucified is a central part of our gospel message. But it is a very scandalous thing in the Roman world, especially in the eyes of the Jews. God's anointed chosen king got killed by these Gentiles, got defeated. It looks like he got defeated shamefully by these Roman soldiers. Scandalous. So did God fail to protect his own king, his own son? Did God fail to carry out whatever he wanted to do through his anointed Messiah? Is that what happened? And Peter teaches in this verse right here, verse 23. No, there is another reality happening together behind and above your actions. And that was more decisive. You crucified and killed Jesus. But that Jesus was delivered according to the definite plan and for knowledge of God. That's what Peter says here. In other words, you were able to do that only because God planned it. This is the ultimate example of the providence of God, how God rules the world. God ordains whatsoever comes to pass in this world. He brings forth all his will, his plan. Everything he desires, he wills, happens. Yet, no violence being done against the free will of his creature. In other words, God accomplished all his plan. He works all things in and by and through the real desires, real decisions of real people. A classical example of this is a Joseph's story. You remember Joseph's story? Those of you who've been in the Sunday school, Joseph's story? That Joseph's brothers betrayed Joseph and sold him to Egypt? I mean, they did it solely out of their own desire, out of their jealousy, out of their hatred towards Joseph. And actually, initially, they wanted to kill Joseph. And then they're like, you know what? Let's just sell him for money. They wanted to do that. It was their will. But it was also the plan of God to bring Joseph to Egypt so that God will make Joseph to be the prime minister of Egypt for the sake of Jacob's entire family and for the future Israel to grow as a king nation and kingdom in Egypt. So later in Joseph's life, Joseph is looking back and said to the brothers, you guys, brothers, what you did to me long ago, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Your decision, your desire, and you did it to me. Evil intention. God has intention. His plan on top of it. He meant it for good. Both working together. God works through the real decisions of real people. Mysteriously. He accomplished his plan without violating the free will of man. These people wanted to kill Jesus out of their crooked desire, out of their wickedness, but God meant it for good. You get it? Let me put it this way. They were able to lay their hands on Jesus only because it was within the definite plan and for knowledge of God. It was not because Jesus could not defend himself. It was not because the God the Father failed to protect his own son. Peter, the preacher who's saying this, knows this better than anybody else because he was the one, when Jesus was about to be arrested, who took out the sword and tried to protect Jesus. And what did Jesus say to Peter? Peter, put back your sword back into its sheath. 
Don't you know that I can appeal to my father? At once, he can send more than 12 regions of angels in a legion in the Roman world. In the Roman army, it's like about 6,000 soldiers. I can call 12 of them, angels, boom, like that. It's not because I cannot defend myself. It's not because Father cannot defend me. Put it back, Peter. So, what was the main decisive factor at Christ's crucifixion? Not Pontius Pilate, out of his fear for crowd and losing his power and position. Not because Judas is carried, because of his love for money. Not because of those religious leaders and the priests out of their jealousy. And not Roman soldiers out of their cruelty and hatred towards despising these Jews, all oh, such scum. They all play parts in this great redemptive story scenario. But the main decisive factor was the plan and the will of God. Then the natural question that follows is this. Why? Why the Father willed it for his Son? Jesus did all the mighty works because God the Father was with him. God the Father was the one proving, he's, this is my Christ, this is my Son. Why would he do this to his only Son? And not only he allowed it, he planned it from long ago. He foreknew it. You know, our parents here, we love our children, right? No amen? Do we love our children? Yeah. Even though they are a lot of time not listening to us, rebellious by the grace of God. I'm going to share more during the parents' seminar. We sinners are naturally meant for parenting. We are not that sacrificial people naturally. Sinners are not. Not living for others. It's very self-oriented people. But by the grace of God, we love our children even though they give us attitude. They started to talk back and you tell them and they don't listen. Stop fighting with your brother. Stop fighting with your sister. Stop. I just told you one minute ago and you're still doing it. Right? We do. Parents, we do get frustrated with them. But this son, this son Jesus, never displeased the father. Not even once. Jesus was not just only son. Jesus was the perfect son. Sinless son. Always obedience. Always pleasing the father. Always delightful to the father. Can you imagine your child being like that? Can you imagine the father's love for this son? And this son is the most wise, most powerful, most good, most glorious son. I know we parents, when your kid does something good, and when he or she gets some sort of award at school or some sort of competition, we are so prideful, ah, so happy, right? And that's the, always the case for this son. Jesus is the most wise and powerful, good and glorious. The pride and joy to the Father. But his crucifixion was a Father's will? What? And church, you know why? Because the Father also loved you. Isaiah 53, verse 4, we find it there. Surely, Jesus, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God, afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wound we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. 
and the Lord lay, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its children is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Can I say that again? It was the will of the Lord to crush him. And he has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering, sacrifice for guilt. Whose guilt? Your guilt and my guilt. He shall see his offspring, which is you and me. He shall pour on his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That was the will of the Father. You know, the gospel has this shocking component in it. It's shocking to see this. Because his grace for the undeserving sinners, for you and me, is beyond our comprehension. It is shocking. It sounds illogical. So even though you are a believer, time to time we ask, Why, God? Why you love me this much? Why you show such grace to me. Unfathomable. Incomprehensible. I don't get it. My friends, see the cross and see the Father's kindness towards you. In your life, see His mercy and love is shining down on you, brighter and stronger than the sun's brightest ray all the time. He gave up his most beloved son for you. He who did not spare his own son for us, but gave him up for us all. Now, the last point. But the plan of God did not end with the death of Christ. It included the resurrection and his glorification. Would you look at verse 24? I'll go quickly this one. God raised him up, losing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Don't be foolish. Sometimes we ask the question, how was the resurrection of Jesus possible? How was it possible that Jesus to be raised from the dead? No, if you ask that question, the scripture will look at you with a smile like, no, 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 the, the real question is this. It was impossible for Jesus not to be raised. Impossible for Jesus to remain dead. Jesus said, remember, I am the life. There is no such thing in life outside of me. I am the life and the resurrection. I am the source of life. No way. Nothing could stop Jesus. Nothing in this universe can hold Jesus from this triumphal resurrection, destroying the gate of death. He couldn't remain in death. He is God. And it is impossible for the Father to, to leave his son in death, leaving him there, knowing the Father's plan involved raising the Son from the dead and exalting Him on the throne above every name that every tongue will confess and every knee will bow before Him, the saying that the Lord, He is the Lord of all. So, that was the Father's will. It does not just end and give Him to the cross. It ends with His raising up, glorifying Him, giving us as Christ's offspring, as his reward, as his inheritance, that Christ will have us. That was the Father's plan for his son because he loves his son. This resurrection was not just something spontaneously happened. It was in the plan of God. And actually, that's the point that Peter is making by quoting the Old Testament, Psalm 16, that this was predicted and prophesied by David in Psalm 16. And the following verse, which we will look into next time, Lord willing, we will go into the next time. Peter quotes from Psalm. You see, the resurrection was prophesied. It was in the plan of God. 
Let me end with this. The resurrection of Christ is at the heart and soul of Christian faith. Like the song we sing. For death could not keep my Savior down. He lives and I am free. Now on my Savior I fix my eyes. My life is his and his hope is mine. For he has promised I too will rise. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where do you stand, my friend? Peter says, Man of Israel, God attested to you in your midst clearly through the mighty words that Jesus is from God and through his death and resurrection, which we are all witnesses of that. So know for certain that God made this Jesus both to be Christ and the Lord. Actually, that is a summary of Peter's preaching in chapter 2 of Acts here. Know for certain. And my question, where do you stand? Is he your Lord and your King, Christ? Do you live like it? Take your stand firm and clearly. Here in this place at church, yes, when you worship, don't be mediocre. Don't, there's no middle ground. Worship him as if he is your really Lord and Savior and King. At your work, at home, at school, take your stand as if you really belong to him. Who is this Jesus Christ to you? Is he Lord and Christ? Then live like it. Take your stand clearly firm. Don't be a mediocre person. Let's pray.